January 10th, 2020, the camera captured the last breaths of La Catrina, a notorious cartel killer who flaunted her guns and curves online, as karma eventually caught up with her when her hideout was stormed by her enemies. Meet the female drug lords who messed with the wrong cartels. Myra Lemus February 18th, 2011, the town of Ciudad Pedro de Alvarado, Guatemala, was buzzing with excitement and anticipation for the upcoming local elections. In a cozy hotel, Myra Lemus, a mayoral candidate, was having lunch with her loyal supporters. They had no idea death was lurking outside. Suddenly, two armored trucks stopped in front of the hotel. A dozen masked men jumped out, armed with assault rifles. They stormed into the hotel and opened fire on the unsuspecting diners. Blood splattered everywhere, screams filled the air, bodies fell to the ground. In total, eight people died that day, including Myra. But this wasn't the first time someone had tried to assassinate Miss Lemus. June 2006, a car carrying Myra and her relatives was ambushed by a group of gunmen. Myra did escape with minor injuries, but her niece was killed on the spot. Now the question is, who would want Myra dead, and why? The answer is simple. Myra was a notorious drug lord. She was one of the queens of the Guatemalan underworld, having a reputation for being ruthless, violent, and merciless. She was famous for being a killer. The whole town was scared of her because she was a killer. It's that simple. She decided who lived and who died. That's how terrified locals described Myra. She struck fear into their hearts, ruling over her drug empire with an iron fist. Her cruelty really knew no bounds. She would stop at nothing to get what she wanted, killing without hesitation, showing no mercy to anyone who dared to cross her path, even those closest to her. Rumor has it that Myra murdered her own husband and disposed of that body in a secluded part of town. However, his remains were never found, and she was never officially considered a person of interest in his disappearance. That's not all though, Myra had also the entire city and police force under her control, with ambitions to control the entire country. So in short, no one dared to challenge her authority. No one. Well, except one man. The Lemus family was just one of two remaining candidates running for the position of mayor. The other one was Roberto Marroquin Fuentes, Myra's political rival, and the leader of a rival crime cartel. He wanted to take over the drug trade in town and the entire country. And for that to happen, Myra and her family needed to be eliminated. Now, when Myra died, he was naturally the prime suspect, but he had an alibi. He claimed that he was nowhere near that hotel when the shooting happened, and he denied any involvement in this attack. But Myra's sister, Maritza, didn't believe him. She was convinced that he was definitely behind the murder, and she swore to avenge her death. Maritza was just as fierce and formidable as Myra. She inherited her sister's drug empire and her thirst for blood. She vowed to kill Marokin and anyone who stood in her way. She would try three assassination attempts on him, but each time he miraculously survived. Well, I mean, he was either very lucky or well-protected, maybe both. Before she could try a fourth time though, Maritza was captured by authorities and thrown into prison. Now, she didn't give up, she still had her goal. She did manage to escape two times, and every time she did, Marokin held his breath. When she was captured after her second escape, she was sent to a supermax military prison. However, it's rumored that she's still planning and waiting for the perfect chance to break free for a third time and finally avenge her sister, Myra. La Cholita she was known as La Cholita, the fearless hit woman who defied death at every turn. Now, she worked for not one, but two ruthless cartels in Mexico, the La Nueva Familia Michoacana and Los Viagras. This woman had no mercy, no fear, and danger followed her wherever she went. Yet, it'd be nothing but her audacious social media posts and YouTube videos that would ultimately seal her fate. Identified in one social media profile as Lucy Cruz and Castillo Hernandez in another, La Cholita used social media and YouTube to flaunt her exploits and taunt her enemies. She would post videos and photos of herself with guns, money, and drugs, even daring to insult the most powerful and feared cartel leader in the country, El Mencho. He is the leader of Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or CJNG known for their brutal violence and involvement in thousands of murders. 
This guy was a former cop who rose to become one of the most wanted criminals in both Mexico and the US, surpassing the infamous Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. In short, he's not someone you want to mess with. However, it seemed like La Cholita didn't quite agree with that. She really thought she was untouchable, maybe even invincible. Well, she thought wrong. <laughs> In November 2020, she would make her last mistake. She uploaded a video where she accused the CJNG of being cowards for abandoning a truck full of weapons. In the video, she mocked, challenged, and provoked him. And well, that kind of audacity doesn't go unnoticed. Soon after that video, the hit woman disappeared without a trace. No one knows what happened to her, no one knows where she is, and God knows if she's dead or alive. Some say she was kidnapped and tortured by the CJNG. Others say that she was killed and dumped in some mass grave. Some do say she's still alive, hiding somewhere, waiting for a chance to strike back. But one thing is certain. When you cross El Mencho, please, never expect a happy ending. Griselda Blanco September 2012, a bullet to the head finally silenced the woman who had created one of the most ruthless cartels in history. Who was she, you ask? Maybe the most feared woman in the Miami underworld. None other than the queen of cocaine. She was La Madrina. Griselda Blanco was a Colombian drug lord, entering the game way before Escobar even became a household name. Now, while Pablo was dominating in the 1980s, Blanco was the unrivaled ruler of the 1970s. What's more, she had a thirst for blood that was unmatched by any man. So during her reign of terror, Blanco had made countless enemies both in Colombia and the US, and really would stop at nothing to eliminate them. From shootings in the shopping malls to drive-bys carried out by motorbike squads, and maybe even some home invasions, Griselda was one of the most lethal women in the entire Colombian cocaine trade. It is believed that she's responsible for at least 200 murders, and some even speculate that that number could be as high as 2,000. A former detective once remarked, People were so afraid of her that her reputation preceded her wherever she went. But Zelda was far worse than any of the men that were involved in the drug trade. Blanco was born to kill. At the age of 11, she allegedly kidnapped a boy for ransom. And when his parents failed to pay, she killed him in cold blood. But all the terror she would inflict on others really stemmed from what she faced at home. And as a result, she ran away from her abusive household and lived on the streets of Medellin, where she learned how to survive by stealing and selling her body. Blanco would get her taste of turning crime into a bigger business when she met and later married Carlos Trujillo, a smuggler of undocumented immigrants into the US. Although they had three sons together, their marriage did not last. Blanco would later have Trujillo killed, making him the first of her three husbands to die by her hand. The second lucky guy was Alberto Bravo, who introduced her to the cocaine trade. They moved to Queens, New York, where they built a massive empire. With direct connection to Colombia, they stole the market from the Italian Mafia. And there, she earned the nickname the Godmother, or La Madrina. Oh, she had this genius way of smuggling coke into New York. She'd have young, beautiful women fly on planes with cocaine hidden in their panties. This scheme proved successful for a long time, allowing her to earn money faster than she could ever spend. However, her newfound infamy attracted all sorts of unwanted attention, leading to the eventual downfall of her empire in New York. In 1975, she and Bravo were caught in a huge NYPD DEA operation called Operation Banshee. Now, before she could be indicted, Blanco managed to escape to Colombia, where she brutally killed her then-husband, Bravo, in a shootout over missing millions. Blanco ended up escaping justice and continued her business in Colombia, proceeding to send cocaine to the U.S. by any possible means. 1976 arrived and she allegedly smuggled cocaine on a ship called the Gloria, which was part of a bicentennial race in New York Harbor. She then decided to move to Miami, where she became the queen of cocaine. This is where she would establish the Miami cocaine scene, distributing drugs across the country with her savvy skills. And because of this, she would have a life of luxury. We saw fancy homes, expensive cars, and even a private jet. Nothing was off limits for her. 
She threw these lavish parties, attracting all the big shots in the drug world. Now let's not forget, she was still playing a deadly game. In Miami, she had some fierce rivals, including the Medellin Cartel. It was only a matter of time before a turf war started, and South Florida turned into a battlefield. July 11, 1979 Some of Blanco's hired guns killed a notorious drug dealer at the Crown Liquor Store in the Daedland Shopping Mall. Then they chased the store workers through that mall shooting at them. It was like something out of Joker's playbook. The assassins came in their armored delivery van with the words Happy Time Complete Party Supply boldly displayed on the side. We called it a war wagon because it had steel plates on the side with holes to shoot from, said a homicide detective. The police ended up seizing that war wagon, so Blanco had to find a better escape plan for her killers. They often used motorbikes for their hits, a method she stuck with way back from the streets of Medellin. Sadly, hundreds of people, innocent or not, met their end this way. Blanco was a person who terrified everyone, even her fellow drug lords. As one expert said, other criminals killed with a purpose. They would check before they killed. Blanco would kill first and then say, well, he was innocent, uh, too bad, but he's dead now. Her most loyal hitman, Jorge Ayala, said that when Blanco ordered a hit, it meant everyone around would likely be wiped out. No one was spared. No women, children. Blanco had no regard for human life. In the 1980s, Blanco's power had reached its peak, with her billion-dollar drug empire smuggling 3,400 pounds of cocaine into the U.S. every month. But law enforcement was closing in on her. A few years later, the DEA tracked her down and arrested her. She was given 20 years in prison. 1994, Blanco got a big shock from behind bars when her trusted hitman Ayala turned against her in a murder trial. This made the infamous godmother have a breakdown. Ayala had enough proof to send her to the electric chair many times over. But surprisingly, a phone scandal between Ayala and a secretary from the Miami-Dade District Attorney's Office messed up the whole case, and Ayala lost his credibility as the star witness. As a result, Blanco had dodged the death penalty and took a plea deal. She would serve only six years in prison, and after she got out, she was sent to Colombia. But she wasn't welcome there. She had made way too many enemies. September 3rd, 2012, at 69 years old, Griselda Blanco was shot twice in the head outside a butcher shop in Medellin. Blanco was killed in a motorcycle drive-by, the same way she had killed so many others. It wasn't clear who did it. Many people suspected the cartels, obviously, but others thought it might have been a vengeful relative of one of her victims. Doesn't even matter. Blanco had so many enemies, it was pretty hard to tell. Karem Lisbeth Yepes Ortiz January 11, 2020 It was supposed to be the happiest day of her life, but for Karem, her wedding day turned into a nightmare. As she exchanged vows with her groom, a notorious drug lord known as El Calamardo, a group of armed men would storm into the church and open fire. She fell to the ground, fatally wounded, and her groom was dragged away by the attackers. Now, her husband was a drug lord, but Karem was also the sister of a notorious kingpin and also came from a family that was heavily involved in the drug trade and had a rivalry with probably the most powerful and ruthless criminal organization in Mexico, the CJNG. The brutal assassination, which shocked even a country accustomed to violence, was witnessed by dozens of terrified guests who fled in panic. The CJNG hitmen wearing bulletproof vests with their logo showed no mercy. They shot at anyone who crossed their path, even killing an innocent boy on his motorcycle outside the church. The mastermind behind this bloody attack was El Mencho himself. He was locked in a bitter feud with Karim's brother, Jose Antonio Yepes Ortiz, aka El Mato, the leader of the Santa Rosa de Lima cartel that specialized in stealing fuel from pipelines in Guanajuato. The spark igniting the deadly feud with the CJNG was a narcomanta or banner that appeared in Guanajuato, threatening the Mexican president to pull out his security forces from the state or face more bloodshed. The banner was signed by El Maro Santa Rosa de Lima cartel, but El Maro soon denied any responsibility for that banner, claiming it was a trap planted by El Mencho. Now, El Mencho clearly didn't like his name being thrown around like that, 
and was determined to wipe out El Maro's cartel and take over his territory. So the wedding massacre was a clear message to El Maro, who managed to escape that scene, leaving his sister behind. The CJNG later posted videos mocking El Mato for his cowardice. After the wedding, El Mato went into hiding and nobody knows where he's at to this day. I don't think this guy's gonna pop out. Can't really expect much from a guy who ran away to save himself and abandoned his own sister in the process. Jocelyn Alejandra Nino. She smiled sweetly for the camera, holding a gun and wearing a bulletproof vest. This is Jocelyn Alejandra Nino aka La Flaca, a cold-blooded killer for the Gulf Cartel. That smile would soon fade, as her photo went viral on social media, exposing her identity to her enemies. La Flaca, meaning the skinny one in Spanish, was a nickname given to her by the Gulf Cartel because of her slender physique. It was a reference to Our Lady of Holy Death, a skeleton saint worshipped by many Mexicans and popular amongst drug traffickers. But La Flaca wasn't a unique name in the underworld. Two other female assassins also shared the same alias, and they both met a horrific end, like if the name itself was cursed. In Mexico, women like Jocelyn were often recruited by these crime groups for their looks and charm. They would help them blend in and avoid suspicion from rivals and authorities. These women often started as lookouts or sex workers, but soon they would climb their way to becoming foot soldiers for the cartel. January 5th, 2015. Jocelyn's fate was sealed when this anonymous user leaked her smiling picture to Valor por Tamalipas, a citizen journalist page that reported on security and crime issues. The photo spread like wildfire on Facebook and X or Twitter. The image introduced Jocelyn as a hit woman for the Gulf Cartel working in Rio Bravo, Tamalipas. She looked pretty innocent, almost childlike, but that weapon and vest portrayed her true nature. Investigators later found out that the leak came from Los Metros, a rival faction of the Gulf Cartel that was at war with Los Ciclones, Jocelyn's group. The leak was meant to weaken Los Ciclones and expose their members on social media, hoping to humiliate them and make them a target for arrest or assassination by rival cartels. Jocelyn was among those responsible for fighting off Los Metros. Her group was tasked with preventing attacks by them in Rio Bravo, Tamaulipas, Rio Bravo was predominantly controlled by Los Metros, which put Los Ciclones at a higher risk during their operations there. This made Jocelyn's job very risky, and the leak only increased the danger. She knew she was living on borrowed time, but she didn't expect it to end so soon. April 12, 2015, Jocelyn and two members from Los Ciclones were captured by Los Metros, and that was the last day anyone saw him alive. A day later, though, Mexican authorities in Matamoros, Tamaulipas stumbled upon a gruesome scene. It would be Jocelyn's mutilated body stuffed inside an ice cooler at a Soriana parking lot. The rest of her remains were in plastic bags. But she wasn't alone. The killers had also left bodies of another woman and a man, both dismembered and decapitated. They were also members of Los Ciclones, who did show signs of being tortured before being killed, probably to extract information. The only way the authorities could identify Jocelyn was by a tattoo on her forearm, with the word Nino, her last name. Now the savagery of Los Metros was not over yet. They took to X, formerly Twitter, to flaunt their gruesome trophies, posting photos of the mutilated bodies as a message to Jocelyn's group. One of these pics showed Jocelyn on the floor, battered and bruised, next to two other victims, moments before they were dismembered. In this other photo, Jocelyn's body parts were crammed inside the cooler, Beside the corpses, Los Metros had scrawled a chilling warning to Los Ciclones. The warning read, This is the fate of all the scum who back Los Ciclones. This warning would also mock the group for using female soldiers and threatening them with more carnage if they dared to enter their turf. But hold up, because now we've saved the best for last. She was a powerful narco queen and hit woman, crossing too many lines and making too many foes even with the police. Oh yeah, they wanted her dead. Maria Guadalupe Lopez Esquivel. January 10th, 2020, the internet was shocked by a gruesome video of a dying woman, drenched in blood and gasping for air. This woman was none other than Maria Esquivel, known as La Catrina, 
the notorious cartel hitwoman who met her fate at the hands of Mexican authorities. As she was cornered in a safe house along with other armed members of the feared CJNG, and as police stormed the place, a body cam recording would show the harrowing moments of her final struggle. She fell behind a wall, her face and clothes stained with blood, and she reached out to the camera with this desperate plea. Let's go back to October 14, 2019. She had led a squad of CJNG gunmen in a savage attack on state police officers in El Laguaye, a town in Aguililla. The officers there were to serve a warrant, but they walked into this deadly trap. The chilling images of the aftermath showed several cops lying dead or wounded on the ground, while their vehicle was riddled with bullets from high-caliber weapons. That assault left at least nine officers injured. Before fleeing the scene, though, La Catrina and her accomplices left behind two messages on a poster board, claiming responsibility for that massacre and threatening other officers who were working with rival cartels. January 10th, the tables turned for the young assassin. According to the local media, somebody had tipped off the authorities that she was in the safe house with other CJNG members, and so they launched a raid. A fierce shootout ensued, during which La Catrina was shot in the neck. The shocking footage of the raid showed La Catrina lying on the ground just fighting for her life while this officer tried to comfort her. He said, Calm down, kid. The helicopter's coming for you. It's coming now. Easy. Easy. You're gonna be okay. Try to hang on. Meanwhile, other CJNG members try to block the roads to prevent the authorities from leaving, forcing the military to call in for chopper support. In another video, a soldier can be seen carrying La Catrina and kneeling on the ground before putting her inside that helicopter that was waiting in Tepalsatepec. Sadly, it was too late. She died a few minutes after that chopper took off. So how did she get into this situation? La Catrina, getting her nickname from the iconic skeletal figure that symbolizes Mexico's Day of the Dead, was a high-ranking member of the CJNG cartel. In 2017, before that, she had left her hometown of Tepalsatepec, where she had crossed paths with Miguel LM2 Fernandez one of the leaders of the CJNG. She fell for him hard and joined the cartel. Rising quickly under his tutelage and living a lavish lifestyle within the criminal underworld. But as often as it happens with a life of crime in the dangerous world of drug cartels, that lifestyle was short-lived. She was only 21 when she died. What a shame.